longer than expected. Okay, here I see it. As I will try to figure this out. Oh, no, it starts now. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the new session of our Quantep seminar series. Uh, sorry for this small delay. We had uh, some issues uh, with the streaming, but it seems now they are solved. So it's a pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Kersti Borras. She is professor at Aachen University and a leading scientist at, at DESI in Hamburg. Uh, I will simply say that uh, in uh, her career, she has been the deputy spokesperson for the CMS experiment at CERN. And today she will present uh, the activities of DAISY about quantum that are you know, uh, having a boost in these years. So welcome, Kerstin, and uh, the floor is yours. Please uh, share your screen. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction. Uh, so I will share my screen now. And while she's sharing, uh, I remember all of you that we are taking questions at the end of, uh, of, of her seminars. You can either unmute yourself uh, or write uh, questions in the chat uh, here in Zoom or in the YouTube. Please, Kerstin. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation to present the quantum technology uh, applications and activities at DESI. Uh, in this uh, seminar series. Uh, so let me first explain what DESI is. Uh, DESI is uh, the synonym for Deutsches Elektronen Synchrotron. So we started out with a small electron synchrotron, but it's a world leading accelerator um, uh, center. So our mission is um, that we are one of the world leading particle accelerator centers. We investigate the structure and the function of matter from different sites, um, from the interaction of the tiny elementary particles and the behavior of novel nanomaterials and vital biomolecules to the great mysteries of the uh, universe. We develop and build particle accelerators and detectors as a unique uh, research tool. And uh, DESI is generating the most intense X-ray radiation in the world accelerate particles to really record energies and open a new window onto the universe. So you see here our four different parts. We have particle physics, we have uh, photon science, astroparticle physics and accelerators. These are the four pillars for DAISY. So DAISY was founded in uh, 1959 as a German National Accelerator Center. We have more than 2,700 employees including 1,200 scientists in all fields and 650 scientists in the field of accelerator operation, research and development, and more than 3,000 visiting scientists from over 40 nations per year. Our uh, approximate budget is 260 million base budget, uh, plus something like uh, 100 million euros third party funding per year. Uh, so we have two locations, one in Hamburg and one in Zeuthen. You saw this on, uh, on my title page. Um, so we are distributed in, in two places. Zeuthen is close to uh, Berlin uh, and belongs to Brandenburg. DESI is a member of the uh, uh, Helmholtz Association. This is uh, Germany's largest scientific association and is our, this is our funding agency. And now let's go immediately to quantum technologies. The Helmholtz Association has updated uh, the strategic roadmap um, end of last year. So uh, here is the um, roadmap uh, and here's the link where you can load it down. Helmholtz, um, as I said, is DESY's funding agencies and is concentrating on five primary active research areas. This is quantum computing simulation, numerical and machine learning methods, quantum sensors, quantum materials and basic research, quantum communication. And in addition to these five pillars, um, the Helmholtz Association develops and operates powerful infrastructure as our accelerators 
for researching the quantum technologies. And um, in the recent years, also DAISY provided here now important and unique uh, contributions to this roadmap of all Helmholtz centers. We have in total 18 Helmholtz centers. So quantum technologies at DAISY is now a strategic aspect. Um, DAISY and the campus partners have excellent scientific competences and facilities for research and development in quantum technologies. Uh, and as we saw it, um, it, these are all crucial complementary to the running research projects um, in US, in China or in uh, Europe. And the cross-cutting activities as uh, quantum technologies are, um, this is really in DAISY's DNA. We have uh, several topics like this uh, as a cross-cutting activity. So we have here a unique pole position to drive the evolution and to play a leading role in dedicated quantum technology topics. And this is why the directorate um, recently really decided that this is a strategic direction for DAISY and established a DAISY quantum technology task force. And we are working now since uh, one and a half a year or almost two years. Uh, so we in identified three initial pillars for quantum technology topics at DAISY. Uh, the development of uh, quantum computing algorithms for applications, materials and photonics research, and the development towards novel quantum devices and scalable and reliable quantum computers. And the last uh, pillar is quantum sensors as an evolving and enabling, but also uh, applied technology. So our overarching goal, uh, which was also motivating our director to really give the green light, is that we want to employ novel quantum technologies to enhance and enable cutting edge. Um, no, I cannot read my data <laughs> in all divisions, as well as to act as a national hub in these areas for the major challenges facing society science and uh, economy. So we have a dizzy wide organization with partners from the campus and the industry. Uh, and we founded now um, DAISY Quantum for the quantum technology applications. So as I said, we have two locations, uh, one in Zeuthen close to Berlin and in Hamburg, uh, but we are all uh, within one box, so to say. So we have quantum simulations, algorithms and methods, benchmarking and access to quantum computers in Zeuthen and as well quantum machine learning and quantum simulations in, in Hamburg. Um, then quantum sensing is also in Zeuthen and also in Hamburg. And um, we have the big area of photon science for quantum materials and uh, quantum devices where we use our unique uh, photon sources uh, to study these materials. And of course, we are involved in knowledge and technology transfer, training and education and outreach. For example, for outreach, we did a very nice and large event for the World Quantum Day on the 14th of uh, April this year. So DAISY in Quantum has uh, uh, achieved um, a major innovation funding from the state of Brandenburg uh, to build the Center of Quantum Technology application here. Uh, they have up to 15 million euros over five years. And the focus topic is to provide access to quantum computer hardware. Of course, also Hamburg is profiting from that uh, because we also can access uh, the IBM computers. Um, another focus topic is to develop applications and use cases enable quantum simulations and benchmark tests and verify the emerging hardware platforms, provide training in quantum computing for um, academia, but for sure also for industry, uh, so to make uh, the new generation uh, quantum ready. Yeah, quantum computing in particle physics and beyond. Here are the pilot projects for quantum computing. Uh, as you all know, quantum computers have the potential to solve problems that cannot be addressed with classical computers. So we develop algorithms and methods, for example, with Carl Janssen, who also gave a seminar here on uh, Tensor Network, uh, for calculations and lattice gauge theories with variational quantum simulations. Um, so they could achieve already novel results for complex uh, theoretical problems. 
Uh, and these programs are frequently demanded by companies. This is why we have this nice uh, contact to IBM to test their novel devices. Then um, we have applications for various models in high energy physics, or, but also in condensed matter physics and others, like, for example, the flight gate assignment, uh, which I will show later. Uh, then developments for error mitigation uh, in quantum computer calculations and uh, methods to optimize the dimensional expressivity for quantum gate circuits in order to also uh, have less gates and lower, lower noise. And then the last point, quantum machine learning for experiment simulation and, and reconstruction. So let's start uh, with uh, an, uh, an example which is not from, from particle physics. So the example for variation uh, quantum simulations this can be um, used also for logistics optimization. Here is the example of the flight gate assignment. Uh, this we do together with DLR. This is a classical optimization problem. So you have all these gates uh, at the Frankfurt airport. And now you have to find the shortest path between the connecting flights uh, with different incoming and outgoing flights. Uh, you, they need to be assigned to gates. And then you want to to really minimize the path the passengers have to go uh, to get the connecting flights or go to the baggage claim or to go to their uh, initial flight. So this can be mathematically described um, analogous uh, to the energy with the Hamiltonian with boundary conditions. And the task is now to find the lowest energy. This means the shortest path. And if you go along this, you find that this Hamiltonian is the same mathematical description for problems in traffic, logistic, aerospace, but also in tracking in particle physics as we have it in our experiment, uh, experimental detectors. So you can use the same formalism. Uh, and here, if you want to use this for optimization, of course, you have to be careful because the quantum computers are still a little bit hampered by errors uh, with noise. Uh, so here one can give an example for error mitigation in the um, in a model for condensed metaphysics, the one dimensional Heisenberg model, which describes also um, magnetism. So here you have the Hamiltonian, which nicely can be expressed with the Pauli matrices. Uh, this is really suitable for quantum computer with this. And you look at nearest neighbor interaction and tensor products. Uh, this shows phase transition and critical behavior and a non-trivial spectrum. So if you do it, if you do the calculations without noise, you see here the exact solution and here the converging uh, solution with the quantum computer really reaching the exact uh, solution. If you then apply full noise, you see that, of course, it, it converges, but it does not converge to the exact ground state. And now you can develop um, error methods, error mitigation methods, and uh, by applying these methods, you can reach the ground uh, state again. So um, details on this error mitigation and the methods uh, you can find here in this publication from Lena Funke, Thomas Hartung, Stefan Kühn, Paul uh, Stornati, Mr. Wang, and Karl Janssen. Yeah, they also, this team also looked into the optimization of the dimensional expressivity on uh, quantum gate circuits, uh, which means the less gates, the minimal gates you have, the less uh, is the noise, uh, because the gate operations are really a source of noise in quantum computing calculations. So um, one wants to develop algorithms and methods in order to really optimize the dimensional expressivity. Uh, so this is an example. Um, you can generate many and complicated states as possible with the fewest number of gates. For non-parametric gates, um, you have algebra algebraic techniques to minimize the gate count. Um, for parametric gates, uh, the algebraic uh, techniques become difficult. Uh, because you have infinitely many uh, generators and here you need a metric for the expressivity, expressivity and this has been developed in this and described in this publication. So what you do is you analyze 
the gate circuit. Um, and then you find, for example, that these four gates are not necessary. So you can take it out and have less noise uh, in your calculations. Yeah, this is a slide from, uh, from Karl Jansen, who is doing the, the theory. I'm more in experimental, so don't ask me about this. Um, so you can look into the lattice Hamiltonian and the lattice spacing uh, for these expression for the QAD and two in two plus one dimensions. You have the electric field operator, the plaquette operator. <clears throat> so and then you can do the first calculations here is a publication from 2000, where this team developed um, uh, some theories uh, towards 2.1 and 3.1 dimensions. So they developed a general truncation scheme, uh, which works over the whole uh, parameter range. And they developed a detailed protocol for trapped ions. And uh, they designed an efficient quantum circuit to demo and demonstrated for the first time magnetic effects. Uh, so here uh, you see uh, the nice descriptions uh, of the calculations. Uh, the same was done then uh, with a nice uh, team at Zeuthen, uh, with two PhD students and with Carl, um, looking at uh, the QED in two plus one uh, dimensions. So here you see uh, the particle mass, um, is, which is a physical quantity. The curve is the exact solution and the dots are the calculated um, uh, values uh, with uh, variational quantum computer simulations. This, so you see that this is a very nice fit. And here you also see uh, for the first time the detecting a phase transition at, neg at a negative mass. And, and this would not be possible to do with Markov chain Monte Carlos. Yeah, let's now uh, turn to another topic, uh, quantum machine learning, early examples in experimental particle physics. So quantum machine learning lies at the intersection of quantum computing and machine learning. And we usually employ uh, the, um, this method uh, to analyze classical data in a hybrid mode. So for example, the high luminosity LHC, uh, which will start something like 2029, uh, needs a vast amount of simulation. And we will have about 200 pileup events per collision. So we need grid computing, big data analysis, uh, and lots, lots of simulations. So if you look uh, here at one LHC um, event with something like uh, 20 pileup events, and we would like to analyze what is the energy going into the forward region of the detector, then it looks like this. One particle is entering our calorimeter, which is measuring the energy and the shower looks um, as in this display, very distributed in the detector. Now you can imagine you have 10 times more events, how this is filled up with signals, and then you have to disentangle all the, the events which are overlaying. This you can do only with massive simulations and trying out. So uh, to simulate all the data rates, uh, which we will have at high luminosity, we need new methods to really cope with this challenge. So we develop machine learning and tensor network methods for quantum computing. First of all, the quantum GAN, the generative adversarial network simulations for detectors. This we do together with CERN Open Lab uh, and a joint uh, PhD student. Uh, another method um, to apply uh, machine learning is tracking with quantum computers for the LAXI experiment at DAISY and at ATLAS. So uh, for LAXI, LAXI is an experiment at DAISY, laser and XFEL experiment. It studies QED in the strong field regime where it becomes uh, non-perturbative. And they use the European XFEL electron beam and a high power laser. You see here a small sketch of the experiment and the heart of the experiment is a tracker which is absolutely dense and filled with, with tracks. And, and here you have a real uh, strong combinatorial, combinatorial uh, challenge. So now um, people are looking, the team is looking into four different approaches. 
One is the conventional benchmark, uh, the ACTS-based tracking with combinatorial Kalman filter technique. The next one is graph neural network, uh, which is constructed from doublets of all nodes on consecutive letter uh, layers that are connected and only the ones that satisfy the pre-selection cuts are kept. And then you have the, the quantum approach uh, where you formulate uh, this uh, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, the QBO, uh, which this is very similar to what has been published here. Uh, so minimizing the QBO is equivalent to finding the ground state of uh, an Hamiltonian. So this QBO, QBO can be mapped into an Ising uh, Hamiltonian and solved using variational quantum eigensolver. So we have these two methods, the conventional and the graph neural network, and then two other set of results, the exact solution of the matrix um, diagonal, dio, dio, <laughs> diagonalization uh, for the eigensolver for benchmarking and the VQE without quantum computing noise uh, using one choice of the ansatz and the optimizer. And here you see very, very early results. So here you see the track reconstruction efficiency as a function of the field intensity parameter uh, xi, which is a, a measure of the density of the tracks. So here you see the conventional method, then uh, the um, eigensolver method, then in green is the uh, quantum computing VQE and uh, the graph neural network. And you see, yeah, sure, there is room for improvement also if you look at the track fade rate, fake rate as a function of the field intensity parameter. Uh, so this is the classical method, uh, then the, the eigensolver method, then here the VQE and the GAN. For sure, he, one has to see, say that this is really very preliminary. For example, the GNN is limited by the training data set side size, which I show later on. So, but what is demonstrated here is that the system with the quantum approach and the classical benchmark is working, which is already very nice, so we can move on. The conventional tracking shows the performance that can be realistically achieved, and for sure there is room for improvement for other tracking methods, and um, there are further optimization studies in, in progress to optimize the things. And here, this is what you achieve if you have more training. So um, here you see the um, accuracy, a measure of the accuracy, the, the smaller, uh, the better. So if you have only one iteration, it improves to two iteration and three um, iterations. The same is true here for the loss uh, value. So it, it looks really promising that uh, we can achieve much better results with, with more training. Let's now go to the um, quantum guns uh, for the calorimeter simulation. So what we wanted to do is to simulate a shower in the detector like this. So of course you cannot start with this uh, very um, high density. So we downsample the 3D shower image into eight pixels, which means that we use, first of all, three qubits. So this looks like the, the downsampling. And we use the hybrid approach, which is quantum uh, generation and the classical discrimination. And uh, as a start, uh, it was uh, the Kiskit gun, quantum gun model was uh, uh, used, uh, which was developed by IBM. Here you see the circuit. And, and this was done, the initial work was done by CERN Open Lab. And uh, this is published here in these two publications. Now with our PhD student, we moved on and, and optimized it a little bit better. Uh, so if you start out uh, with a uniform initialization, um, then you cannot really achieve a good uh, description of the original Géant simulation. Um, but if you have a trained model, this becomes much better. So here the training time was something like uh, one day for 3000 epochs. Um, and uh, we had to speed up the training. So we did a hyperparameter optimization with a higher learning rate. 
uh, we implemented exponential learning rate decay and the different generator and discriminator learning rate and we trained the discriminator more often than the generator and we uh, achieved a 10 times speed up in the training time so we need only 300 uh, epochs instead of 3000 but the accuracy is much better this is the not optimized training uh, for for almost 4000 epochs and this is the optimized training and you see that you have reached the nice value already after 150 epochs and this is published here in the proceedings of the grid uh, 2021 conference yeah we also applied noise everything else was without noise now you can apply readout noise uh, so here you see no decrease in accuracy uh, the readout noise uh, the readout error is uh, for the three qubits 3.6 percent 4.7 percent and 9.6 percent which was really the largest one what uh, what we saw still we could achieve uh, a nice accuracy and a fast convergence here with, with 300 then one can apply the full noise uh, so in addition to the readout error uh, a gate error uh, of up to 1.75 percent so still we can achieve a nice um, description and accuracy and uh, a fast convergence uh, here you see a three, 300 epochs. Yeah, we also studied the impact of uh, quantum noise on the training on, on quantum guns uh, together with a team of, uh, of CERN Open Lab with us and uh, with a team of, um, of Carl Janssen. Here you see uh, all authors of, of this paper. So first of all, there was a detailed studies with noise and noise mitigation to find out the importance of hyperparameters for different values of bit flip probability. Uh, and uh, this was 1%, 5%, and 10%. And we looked at the generator learning rate uh, here, at the discriminator learning rate uh, here, and the exponential decay rate gamma for the learning uh, layers here. So what you see, uh, this is uh, as a function of the importance value for the objective uh, value. And you see that the generator learning rate is, is most important for all um, error levels. Uh, so the gen generator learning rate has the highest impact and this demonstrates uh, the difficulty of training of the quantum generator. Yeah, we also looked into a different dependency for bit flip probability and the and its uh, mitigation so here you see uh, the relative entropy as a function of the bit flip probability and uh, this is the dashed line is without noise uh, then in orange you have no mitigation and you see starting from six percent onwards it really becomes worse uh, here but with the um, uh, bit flip mitigation from IBM, as well as uh, with the self-developed uh, bit flip mitigation, one can really cure this problem here up to 10%. So this is very nice. Uh, and then the next plot shows uh, a similar result, but now with gate noise. So here you have uh, the relative entropy as a function of the training epochs. Uh, First of all, with no noise, here the dashed black line, uh, then the readout noise, uh, the added readout noise, which is very similar, so it converges and, and becomes very small. But then if you switch on uh, the gate noise, uh, then it doesn't reach uh, the lowest level anymore. Um, and also, the um, the self-developed uh, error mitigation it does not help to cure this this problem so um, this is a, a real critical effect of the two qubit uh, gate errors on the quantum gun training with the current NISC devices yeah we also try uh, try to have quantum guns in in two dimensions because ah, in the end our calorimeter is three-dimensional plus the time plus the energy so five dimension and um, 
So we, we, we started out to go further to, to two dimensions. So we downsampled this uh, diagram to eight by eight pixels with six qubits. Uh, and uh, you have here the uh, 1D stacking and, and then in logarithm. What we used, uh, we adapted uh, the tree tensor network uh, from this publication here. We did not use the full network, uh, but only part of it because we have six qubits. And also here, we could achieve uh, a good description of the Géant uh, simulation and uh, quite uh, reasonable con conver uh, convergence. So we have present cooperations in science uh, for developing uh, algorithms and methods with the Perimeter Institute, uh, University of Bath, Cyprus University and Cyprus Institute, MIT uh, in Boston, Peking University, um, also Hamburg University, Berlin University Alliance, Saarbrücken University, Helmholtz Center, Jülich and Max Planck uh, in, in, uh, Society. Simon, I realized that Padua is missing, <laughs> yeah, so I should have added Padua. Um, then towards uh, Gorge series, we have Institute of Quantum Computing in Waterloo, in Innsbruck and uh, Barcelona and Ulm University, and for the experimental and particle physics and track reconstruction and simulations with quantum guns, CERN Open Lab and LBNL. Also, we have industry participations uh, with IBM. We have a German government funded program for noise mitigation and employment uh, for quantum algorithms. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary cooperation with a startup uh, with the University of Saarbrücken, Berlin, and the Research Center of uh, Jülich. And we have uh, a common program for error mitigation in software engineering modeling. Uh, together with the University of Hamburg. And we have the granted uh, quantum computing access for industry through the uh, Brandenburg funding. Then we also work together with uh, uh, Rigetti for error mitigation studies, uh, together with the Cyprus University and uh, Institute and MIT. We have an EU funded PhD education network, um, Engage, it is called, uh, with several um, in EU institute and universities, but also here the industries here. Um, and there is a EU funded Quantera project, TNISC, uh, which is developing quantum inspired algorithms to model and design quantum devices, test them in state of the art quantum simulations and computations, and to develop um, benchmark tools for high dimensional quantum systems in the presence of noise. And there are emerging cooperations with Institute for High Performance Microelectronics in Frankfurt Oder. And also in Hamburg, we just uh, today in the morning had a kickoff meeting uh, with industry and academia uh, for quantum computing. So this is all gearing up and uh, getting really intense. Now I would like to close this chapter for quantum computing. This was quite a lot and go to photon science for quantum materials and quantum devices. Um, so what, what is really necessary is, um, yeah, we, we have to improve the quantum computers and there's uh, plenty more room for, for quantum if you here see the number of qubits and the size of Hilbert space with this, which is opened by the number of qubits. It's, it's really incredible. But we need to develop a useful um, quantum algorithms and uh, build a robust and scalable universal quantum computer. And here you have some of the different um, kind of quantum computers, superconducting circuits, quantum dots, color centers, trapped ions, and topological um, systems. So, but all of them have to be tested. Uh, and this we can do uh, with uh, our quantum materials analytics at DESI with our different photon sources. So we have here small um, uh, rings uh, with DESI 2, uh, but then we have uh, PETRA 3, uh, which is uh, already brilliant. This will be upgraded to PETRA 4, and you see here the collimation, which is really excellent then uh, when we have PETRA 4. We also have uh, linear colliders, um, like flash one and flash two, uh, and also the 
European XFAL, uh, which is much stronger than flesh. So what we do is uh, we want to find out and cure what causes uh, the um, problems in, in quantum computing, what uh, causes the uh, decoherent things. So we want to go from fundamental understanding of quantum phenomena in materials to the development of really tailor-made materials for quantum technology devices, including uh, innovative qubit systems, uh, quantum sensors, etc. So the DZ light sources are really uniquely powerful quantum tools. Petra 4 will be an ultimate um, multidimensional quantum microscope. Um, but for the moment, when we do not have it yet, um, we do precision spectroscopy on quantum materials, really to understand the atomic and electronic structure and connect um, to the functional properties. We do ultra-fast spectroscopy on quantum materials to really assess the couplings and the decoherence mechanism to understand them and avoid them. And we move on further to X-ray quantum optics. Uh, to, uh, we employ nuclear resonance scattering to extend the quantum optics to the hard X-ray uh, range in order to explore the vastly different coupling strengths, uh, photon energies, and material parameters uh, to improve the generalization of uh, underlying theories and um, potential discover novel applications that require exotic parameter sets. So what we are thinking of uh, to establish then also is a quantum materials analytic labs, which is a fast reaction materials analytics laboratory. And here in this review, um, it was requested to have to really cope with the material challenges and opportunities for quantum computing hardware. Here, they, the claim is that it is important to develop high throughput methods uh, for correlating qubit uh, measurements with direct material spectroscopy and characterization, a materials discovery pipeline uh, that exploit directed and rational materials researches in concert with high throughput and uh, characterization approaches. So this is what we, we try to, um, is in discussion, but also try to set up. We want to use this um, quantum materials analytic labs and employ all the facilities we have. Daisy Nanolab uh, for the preparation of the materials, uh, novel methods, and as I said, ultra fast uh, spectroscopy, X-ray scattering at Petra 3 and photo electron spectroscopy uh, and then nano imaging and nano spectroscopy at Petra 4. So, and with this, we would like to give um, the service uh, to accelerated development of quantum materials platforms and services for industry. Uh, so we are working on that. Another topic for DZ quantum is uh, quantum sensing. And uh, at the end, I will also tell you something about outreach. So for quantum sensing, uh, this is an enabling technology for novel experiments and operation. So we would like uh, to explore and develop and apply quantum sensors and electronics and particle and astroparticle physics experiments and for sure also beyond, uh, for example, for photon science or the accelerator uh, controlling. So as an evolving and enabling technology, it is part of our genuine detector R&D but it is also already applied in operating experiments like in um, ALPS2. Uh, they use the transition edge uh, sensor, um, the superconducting single photon detectors for ALPS2. Uh, and here's the example. Uh, these transition edge sensors are uh, operating in the superconducting transition region. The detection challenge here is um, you have to look at uh, 1,064 uh, 1, nanometer photon detection with extremely low dark uh, counts required. Uh, so, and you have extremely low rate, rates, about 10 to minus 5 per second. Uh, the transition edge sensors um, are, are running at DC, and the noise reduction is successful. The resolution is something like 10% and there are extremely low intrinsic dark counts. So 
Here, ALPS is a, a really useful example because it is an active experiment using quantum sensors, but also it is um, an R&D platform. Uh, so ALPS uh, has established a, a second um, um, cryostat and, uh, for example, Cardiff uh, paid half of this uh, cryostat and they use this now as a platform where visitors uh, from other institute from Germany or UK and elsewhere are coming to work with DESI to understand these transition edge uh, sensors. So the other uh, item uh, that is uh, addressed at DESI are highly charged ion clocks as sensors for ultralight dark matter within uh, the QS network. So here you see a picture of the electron beam ion trap in, in Heidelberg that should be used for dark matter searches at DESI. So uh, what you use here is uh, you use the quantum sensors for the search of ultralight uh, dark matter uh, by looking at uh, spatial and temporal violations of the fine structure alpha and, and mu. So you search the dark matter by, by, by looking uh, for these variations. Uh, the optical atomic clocks are um, enabling technology using the electron transition fre frequency and um, the high frequency mode lock laser for optical transition. The frequency uncertainty um, uh, of, of this very low value is better than one second in the age of the universe and it is ultra sensitive, for example, to dark matter variations in the fine structure constant and uh, Stephen Worm is working strongly uh, to set up uh, all these, these things. We also work for outreach. So we had um, the outreach World Quantum Day uh, in 2022, so on last, um, last April. So we had a, a, an online event uh, where we had a public lecture on the 13th of April and then on Thursday in the morning discussions and presentations. So we had four blocks, uh, one for quantum computing, one for quantum materials, one for quantum sensing and uh, quantum communication, and also for te um, technology transfer. So we always had a, a spin-off talk, uh, then a panel uh, to introduce with uh, five, five members, and then a discussion round. And after all these four blocks, which were very interesting, and I think the 40 minutes per block were, were really not sufficient, we had a poster session where people could really individually um, display their, their activity. So let me summarize uh, Desi's competences uh, in quantum technology. So Desi develops a large variety of quantum computing applications. Um, variation in quantum simulations, quantum machine learning and simulations and reconstruction and more. So this is useful for particle physics, condensed matter, as well as for optimization problems and simulations and reconstruction of detectors and arbitrary events. Algorithms, the algorithms which we develop can be general, generalized towards many interdisciplinary areas, for example, logistic or scheduling or more med medical applications. Um, DESI also develops method for efficient uh, quantum computing with error mitigation and uh, expressivity optimization and benchmark tests for quantum computing hardware. Yeah, we employ our unique uh, photon source facilities to really understand the working of quantum materials, shape and design tailor-made materials for quantum devices like qubits and, and sensors. Uh, DAISY is studying and developing quantum sensors um, to apply and operate quantum sensors in new experiments and evolve and enable unprecedented precision for novel experiments to answer really fundamental questions. So this is the summary. Ah, I forgot the technology transfer where we are also very active. So thank you for listening to this talk. And uh, now it's time for, for questions. Thank you very much, Kirsten, and uh, also for being uh, perfectly on time. <laughs> 
So the floor is open for questions. Uh, if you want, uh, you can write it in them in the chat or uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak. Yes, I have one question. Yes. Yes. Regarding the um, quantum neural network and the, the generative models that you are developing and using, what is the real advantage of the quantumness of these uh, of these uh, networks? In the sense, how much entanglement is generating during uh, the training process? Or uh, the... in other words, it's possible to simulate classically this system. Yeah, of of course we do the detector simulations uh, on a, on a classical. Uh, on a classical computer, but this this takes much too long. So, uh, if we have uh, ten ten times more intensity and interaction and and events, and then two hundred pileup events, I think uh, we we cannot really efficiently simulate with classical computers. So we need uh, the the quantum approach. And what you said is um, how much entanglement you have. This of course depends on your circuit. Um, so uh, our PhD student at uh, CERN Open Lab uh, was developing an, a new circuit. At the moment, we had used the IBM approach, but this has a big disadvantage for us because uh, it only generates average pictures, but we need individual pictures uh, and, and many of them. So we were uh, thinking about a new model. The first starting point he had was to have a really kind of brute force um, generation where you have 20 qubits and, and then entangle um, bit by bit, uh, but only two bits of these. This didn't work at all. So we could not really um, um, master the uh, correlations between the, the shower bits and pieces. Now he has used uh, a kind of, of tensor network uh, as we had uh, for the two dimensional yeah. thing. Um, and there we see already now some uh, nice correlations as we see it in the in the classical uh, simulations. And then he tried um, uh, to uh, to turn the knobs in the parameters uh, for some parameters. And and it's really nice. You you turn it in, in the beginning of the shower and you see the result at the end of the shower. So this was really uh, instructive what he did. Uh, so there's a lot to do um, to get really nice shower pictures. Okay, thank you very much. Joao, I see your face is... Uh, yeah, yeah I, just, I just arrived. Sorry, Kerstin, I was teaching before. <laughs> but I actually have a question for you. I mean, uh, you have shown these uh, dark matter detectors, okay? And my question is, as you know, in Portugal, there are also there is also teams which are studying or trying to, to measure and to find dark matter. The question is, uh, in comparison with traditional... Um, dark matter uh, detection experiments, how far away does this uh, approach put us with respect to the traditional state-of-the-art uh, experiments? Yeah, I, I do not have the diagram with me, so I, unfortunately I cannot, I cannot tell you. Maybe somebody in the auditorium can know something. Uh -huh. Sorry, but I will, I will ask uh, Stephen and, and come back with the answer to you. No, because this is a very interesting approach actually, because, thank you. I see Pedramas uh, raised hand. Yes, thanks very much, Kerstin, for the very interesting talk and uh, the program that you're developing over there is, I must say, I'm quite impressed. Uh, I have two questions about the tracking part. Uh, first of all, um, maybe you covered it, but I didn't get the picture really. Um, what are the, I mean, you, you said very realistically that the, in terms of efficiency and fake rate for the moment, the tracking, has still a space to improve. What are the next uh, steps that you envision uh, for for going, for taking to 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 improve that? Yeah, the, the following plot which I showed was uh, with much more training. So you see already that that this is improving, and uh, one of the author uh, Cheng is um, has worked already in his master thesis for Atlas, and he has presented his results in the. Uh, inter-experimental uh, machine learning workshop, I think it was last year, and it was impressive what uh, they achieved for ATLAS. So I hope uh, that we can have uh, the same uh, quality uh, as they achieved for ATLAS. Uh, of course, there he had a, a large machinery and, and ATLAS um, 
surrounding software. Um, Luxie is, is a small experiment, um, a very small team, so we have to work more. But, but you saw the improvement already with more training. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second question is still about the track tracking because in Lisbon we uh, we did, as you might know, uh, a quite substantial work about estimating really mathematically the complexity of the Kalman filter um, uh, of uh, of CMS uh, of the CMS tracking, and basically our picture is the following: is that uh, I mean basically, as you might guess, the the motivation behind getting the complexity pic picture is that lower complexity will result uh, um, uh, in in basically faster tracking in perspective of pileup reduction, etc. Um, have you ever tried uh, estimating the the complexity, the mathematical complexity of the algorithms that you're uh, developing? No, I don't think uh, that somebody of the tracking group thought about it. It's uh, I will ask them. Um, I, I think this would be a very good approach to really estimate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in the and if I may just finish in the continuation of that, it would be really interesting. You know, uh, once basically the efficiency will reach the same level, at least that what we have, the fake rates as well. As you know uh, very well, the the big uh, figure of merit is uh, the timing uh, so i think that uh, uh, also you know if we can um as people who are you know high energy physicists and very interested in working in uh, in in quantum algorithms and computing if we can prove to the community that the efficiency is high as with classical methods uh, the fake rate is as low as uh, the same while the timing is substantially improved uh, this is basically uh, i would say uh, yeah don't want to pronounce the word supremacy, but um, it's basically a winning scenario, particularly in the perspective of high luminosity LHC. So yeah. it would be really interesting with your team to also uh, already uh, start, you know, the habit of timing, simply timing the algorithms uh, compared to the classical Kalman filter. Yeah, I, I think it's it's timing. Um, this is a big advantage also for the calorimeter simulations. Um, the time that, that they take uh, is much slower, but I, I think, I also would like to stress uh, that we have a green aspect here because quantum computers might in the end not use so much energy <laughs> as, as other classical computers. Huh? And one has to stress it because some people say ah, quantum computers are far away. Today in the morning they said mm, 15 years or so. No, we can try and develop already now and we should start now. So uh, we have time for uh, another question for sure. So Hideki, please. Uh, hi, um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the very inspiring talk. I'm, I'm connecting from China and I work on CMS. Um, I, I know that the, you know, the recent majority of work is going more in the qubits, but how do you, uh, what is your vision toward the quantum annealers which is is the the usage is more limited, I I, I believe. But uh... I think uh, for the quantum annealer, depending on the technology you use, if these are chips like for Fujitsu, it would be nice to have to try them in the trigger, because they really can can quickly take um, a decision. So, yeah, somebody needs to try it. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Um, that would be a, also a very nice improvement. Okay, I see. But, but, but you know, they, they do not give out their, their technology and uh, just going with our data to, um, to D-Wave or Fujitsu, that, that is difficult. Input and output is, is still a, a problem for quantum computers. Hmm? I see. Thank you. Okay, so uh, seems there are no further questions. So I would like to thank uh, Kerstin again with a virtual applause. And uh, uh, I will ask uh, Rafaela if uh, you can share the, yes. So actually before that, I will, I will take, but given that you mentioned the Quantera project in ISC, 
I will uh, I will uh, take this occasion to make some advertisement, given that I coordinate uh, that that Quatera and the uh, project that just started, uh, and uh, there are uh, Desi, of course, Padova, uh, San Sebastian, Innsbruck, and uh, and uh, Slovenia partner, and so and we are hiring. Uh, so if anybody is interested uh, or knows someone interested, uh, just simply con contact one of one of the groups. And uh, after that, I would uh, uh, announce uh, next uh, next uh, month's uh, Quantep seminar, as it, as you can see from the slide here, uh, uh, delivered by Na Nathan Weber of the University of Toronto. As usual, the second Wednesday of of the month, every every uh, at the same time. And uh, uh, next slide, yes, I also want, to, of course, to thank uh, the, our uh, members of organizing committee, Yasser Omaju, our sections, and Andres Ambainis, and uh, uh, the most important ones, Rafaela Ribeiro and Sagrat Prata, see that uh, make this possible. So thank you very much once again, and see you next month. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.